This is BYU Sports Nation, brought to you by the BYU Store, simulcast on BYU-TV and BYU-Radio. Now, from Studio B, here's Spencer Linton and Jerem Jordan. BYU Sports Nation is live, your day-to-day play-by-play in Studio B, presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Monday, April 12th, wherever and however you're connected, great to have you with us. I am Spencer Linton, teamed up alongside a man who knows there is money in the banana stand, Jerem Jordan. Yeah, our guy, Michael Bluth. Uh, congratulations, uh, BYU Track and Field sets the uh, you know outdoor 400 record, 45.68. Woo! Broke a 22-year-old record. That's older than uh, most of the uh, BYU students here. And I quoted the tweet from Track and Field and Cross Country said, "There's money in the banana stand." <laughs> now, I, this is a this is a reference to Arrested Development. If you haven't seen it, you're not going to get the joke. Um, you got to watch it. But Riley Nelson uh, responded, "So incredibly impressive to have accomplished this while single-handedly <laughs> keeping the Bluth Company afloat." <laughs> Which is absolutely true. If you haven't seen Arrested Development, it's high quality content. It's it's good stuff. The last time we talked to Michael Bluth, last time he broke a record, the he, time we've talked to Michael Bluth, he admitted that he hadn't seen like one minute of the series. So we're like, yeah. watch the show. He said that people yell lines from. The, <laughs> it's very quotable. Uh, <laughs> great writing. Uh, the the Russo brothers who did Endgame and Infinity War directed. They were they were some of the uh, you know writers and directors there. So. Pretty, uh, pretty fun stuff. Oh, brilliant show. And we have a brilliant show lineup for you today on Monday. Who's the next best pro prospect training right now within the BYU football program as Zach Wilson and Brady Christensen and others have now departed? We'll ask former NFL linebacker David Nixon that question. We'll also ask him why he's optimistic about Zach Wilson's chances to succeed with the New York Jets, plus another national championship for BYU Athletics. And what's the biggest missed call in the history Mm. of BYU sports? This based on some drama last night in Major League Baseball. Here are today's BYUSN headlines. Men's volleyball splits the weekend with UCLA, just the third loss of the season. BYU finished a 17-3 in the regular season, clinching the MPSF regular season championship and one seed in next week's tournament in Provo on Flow Sports. Congratulations to the Cougars on Another regular season title. Number 16 BYU women's soccer beats Pepperdine in Malibu for the first time since 2012. Whoa. Two to one the final. Goals from Ashton Brockbank Johnson and Cameron Tucker. But due to the newly implemented Ken Pomeroy index. What? In soccer? The 13th ranked Santa Clara Broncos are declared West Coast Conference champions with a week left to play. The Cougars will return home for senior day this Saturday, 3 Eastern against Portland. Ken Palm in soccer. Okay, let's go. Track and field produced some top 10 marks. School history over the weekend. We mentioned Michael Bluth. Also, Haley Folsom Walker had the sixth best heptathlon score in school history. Awesome. Sable Lohmeyer L. Bakri, married to Bracken. Uh, had the 10th best hammer throw ever Woo. at 54-35 meters. I mean, some unbelievable performances, and there are a million good performances. We only had time to mention three. Jerem, speaking of great performances, congratulations to the Cougarettes yeah. on another national championship. That's like their, what, 20th overall? I, I think when Brigham Young said this is the place, it's from that moment to now. Holy cow. First title, however, for new co-head coaches Stacy Bills and Morgan St. Pierre. Congratulations, ladies. Always getting it done. I was roommates with Morgan's brother, Steve, at uh, BYU. So that, there you go. Small Sorry, world. Right, brother-in-law. Very cool. Brother-in-law. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, Morgan is married to Steve. Correction. <laughs> Cougar softball has won nine in a row. After a three-game sweep of St. Mary's, two notable marks were hit. Riley Jensen scored her 200th run, second best in BYU history. That's Woo. amazing. Pitcher Autumn Moffat korth got her 300th strikeout. Uh, it was not in the game. It was for her career, just to know that. BYU versus Idaho State tomorrow, 8 Eastern on the BYU TV app. The ladies keep winning. Yeah, they're finding ways to win, Jerem. They trailed 6-1 to one in game one and then had nine runs scored in the next two innings to win that game. That'll do. They win the second game on Saturday, one to nothing. So they're just fine ways, nine in a row. BYU baseball, uh, they could use a little bit of that magic. They drop another heartbreaker to Portland on Saturday at Miller Park, losing seven to six in the ninth inning. So the Pilots win the series two games to one. Boo. BYU walked it off on Friday night. They're six and six overall in West Coast Conference play. Running out of room if they want to make a run at that WCC title. They're going to have to do something special over the last month. Yeah, just keep getting better. 
Men's tennis sweeps San Diego 4 0, improving 5 0 in West Coast Conference play, and the women lost to San Diego 6 1. And some men's and women's BYU golf today. The women in the Lone Star Invitational, they're currently tied for fourth as a team. Kirsten Fotu, three under. She's tied for fifth overall individually. The BYU men's team tees off in the 74th annual Western Intercollegiate later today. All rise and shout. It's time for What's Trending. You're talking about it, and so are we. It's What's Trending on BYU Sports Nation. The next great BYU football pro prospect. We asked SB Nation's Cam Miller, and the guy who let out on the hype train for Zach Wilson before anybody Loved him first. was saying that Zach Wilson was an NFL guy. We asked him, okay, now that Zach's gone, and a number of other very talented players, who's the next great BYU football pro prospect and he said, I don't need any time at all to think about this. It's Peyton Wilgar, and right now, I would take him on day two. Wow. So, Meaning second or third round? Yeah. There's some real confidence in Peyton Wilgar. Jeremy, I'm going to ask you the same question. Ask it. Who is the next best BYU football pro prospect? There are several, and uh, Peyton is certainly up there, uh, if not the best. Uh, I think Isaac Rex is an intriguing prospect. Um, and I don't know that I have a next best, like just a single guy. I've got a group, um, so we'll talk about him in a sec. But let's lead out with Isaac Rex. What a freshman year he had, right? Double-digit touchdown catches, uh, really capable and good target in the end zone. Someone has to catch passes, and it was Isaac Rex in the end zone to lead the way for BYU. Kind of stepped into that match Bushman spot. Bushman had struggled scoring touchdowns mm-hmm. in his career. Had, what, six, I think, in, in those three seasons. But was super short-handed. Isaac Rex doesn't drop the ball. Blocks well. He lead hands. Uh, I, Isaac Rex is a guy that he's not going to come out after this next year, although he could. He's been out of high school over three years, right? Um, but he had a tremendous year. He's one of several guys who I think – when Isaac's done at BYU, whether that's in two or three years, uh, or three or four, um, is an intriguing prospect. I've got a list as well, but I think at the top probably stands BYU center James Empey. I thought that Jim Empey. he might come out of BYU this year, but he got banged up end of the season. and He just didn't have maybe, a great season. Yeah, maybe his yeah. stock dropped a little bit, but pro, a good season. pro football focus was really high on him. His numbers were very before, solid before, before, the before year. this year. They weren't saying the same things after this right. year about him. I think he has the capability to yeah. reestablish himself again against a Power 5 schedule, be the guy. So I like James Empey a lot coming off that revamped BYU offensive line. If not James, I agree with Cam Miller. Peyton Wilgar is so good in his pass game coverage at yeah. linebacker, that will translate nicely to the NFL. And he's, he's big. About James, so his ankle injury certainly slowed him down, like literally, and, and pun intended there. But um, hopefully he has a big year because he was, yeah, as you mentioned, one of the highest rated centers. He was the highest rated center. Coming into in the season. football coming into 2020. Yes. Um, now the, the, uh, you know, the schedule ramps up, so it's, it's harder for sure. Peyton's intriguing, too, because he's like 6'3", 240. Like, he is NFL size already. He's rangy, and he led the Middle team in interceptions type. in 2019 with three. Yeah, one of those notably against USC. That was a big one. So, yeah, Peyton Wilgar is a guy that you'd think would get drafted and kind of continue that BYU linebacker U kind of thing. Other guys in the mix. I think Puka Nakua down the line is going to be one that's okay. interesting. Um, Ryan Rico is a Ooh. punter. No one wants to talk about a punter, Spence. But Ryan Rico had an NFL-type punting season. Like, well, he Dave was McCann un- wants to talk about punters. <laughs> yes, he does. Why factor pick? Um, <laughs> Ryan Rico was incredible. Perhaps the most underrated player on the team last year. Because he was the most underused player on the team last barely, year. Barely used, right? Right? Um, you know, like, like a Clippers on a bald man. But uh, Tyler Algier as well. Tyler Algier had a 1,000-yard season. Big, physical running back, fast, which is awesome. Now, Tyler did not have a great game against Houston, which was one of the bigger games of the season. So he's, he's going to have a chance to prove himself against mm. a different type of schedule. But what the step he took forward was massive. And I'm excited about Tyler. I don't think he has a 1,000-yard year against the schedule, but I think he gets to the 800 mark. And the real important mark will be against seven power fives, can he be four and a half yards per carry plus? That's the hope. A lot of people compare him to Harvey Unga, and that's a great compliment. But he's not as Different. big as Harvey. No. He's a little faster yes. and more explosive than Harvey is at the line Harvey, of though. scrimmage. Harvey was incredible at making Everything. guys miss gr- tackles and bruiser. running over dudes. Bruiser. Great hands. Yes, incredible yep. hands. Tyler's a little more shifty, 
a little quicker. And word has it, while BYU had their pro day set up in place, Tyler was clocked running a four three nine. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. So he he would certainly get a look at that point. Mm. Okay, topic two. Last night the Phillies beat the Braves seven six. Controversial play at the plate. It, it it went to review. There's no way that that call was correct. They said uh, you know the runner uh, Alec Bohm didn't touch home plate or did touch home plate. He didn't. He didn't. Darno got him at the plate, right? Five different angles confirmed this. So, what's the biggest missed call in BYU Sports history? Because that was, a, that was a, Major League Baseball freaked out last night. Oh, yes, rightfully so. What's the point of replay if you're not going to overturn the oh, call? You don't have to tell me twice. Men's volleyball. Sometimes I'm like, I, uh, I say that once a match. I go, I completely disagree with that. I go, you serious? <laughs> Man, this brings up a lot of mostly negative memories. <laughs> <laughs> the first oh, one that geez. came to mind was Brandon Bradley oh. in 2010 against <sighs> Utah. The Utes are ranked. Jake keeps his freshman starting on the road. Interception. His knee was clearly down. And if that call is upheld, or sorry, uh, overturned. Unfortunately, we have video of this. Then BYU wins the game. His knee is down before the ball is strapped. But they rule that Utah recovers, and then the Utes go on to win the game. Late BYU controversy. Could have, BYU could have made a field goal yes. to win as well. Yes. Let's not uh, lose sight of that. That's true. They okay. could have blocked on the outside. Okay. That, that one right. is a killer. All right. All, right. All right. Let's get past that one because I hate that one. Um, oh, here we are. Just yeah, going to slow-mo yeah. just to kind of drive this the point home. This is HD, home. too. There's no the mountain excuse here. His knee okay. is down. Right All there. Right. All right, let's. Oh gosh, I wish it was clearer. Uh, Two thousand. Buey got away with one. Mm. Okay, Luke Staley on the drive. Lavelle's the miracle. You know, Brandon Doman and Luke Staley. Luke Staley fumbles the ball. He just does. If review is used, then mm-hmm. that's a fumble, and Utah wins, and Lavelle finishes on a loss to Utah. Oh, well, called one in favor of BYU. BYU. They missed a call that went BYU's way. Uh-huh. Okay, sometimes that happens. I think when you hear missed calls, you just think the negative one automatically, right? <laughs> there are positive missed calls. Uh, okay, back to the negative. Uh, tw- <laughs> 2014, oh. BYU's at UCF. You're standing in the end zone, this I think, hurts. on this one. Yes. Jordan Leslie is clearly interfered with and in overtime. and they This don't, was so bad. They don't call this. They don't call. There's contact before the ball's even there. Jordan Leslie can't believe it. He's going to put it on his IG story today about it. He's living his best life. Yeah, He's th- being this was held like two seconds before the ball oh, arrives. And this was a Skycam game, Spence. Oh. Oh. Skycam. Brutal. So, yeah, BYU gets burned yeah, look, in no, Orlando. Look, Drake look all at, over him! How is Seven it? years later, I'm not happy what? about it still. What? Let's go back to 2008 we can BYU basketball. Day. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a good one. Arizona State. James Harden, Ugh. the beard, Pre, pre-beard. Okay. Charles Abuel makes a shot at the buzzer yep, for like BYU. An amazing tip back. Amazing tip in. BYU wins the game. They upset nationally ranked Arizona State and James Harden. But the officials decide to wave off the basket. Okay, because, there, and Gregor Bell talked about this because he knows the rule book, man. Um, there, the clock is one thing and the red uh, you know, light in the backboard is another, and they were not on the same frame. They were one frame off. Oh, and so the refs looked at the wrong one. I can't remember whether it was the uh, you know the red in the backboard or the clock. Naturally, they looked the, at the wrong one that hurts BYU. You think the clock would be the number one? <laughs> um, that it, one stings because yeah. BYU should have won that game. Like yeah. they beat Arizona, they beat Arizona State. They won the that game. That was going to be a big win, <sighs> and that was on the same day as the Vegas Bowl in Arizona, uh, or, or against Arizona, and. I didn't think they'd have that game on up in the booth. Yeah. So I called KSL and I said, can you just put me on hold so I can hear uh-huh. the game? This is pre like app, you know, <laughs> where you can just listen to everything. So I'm sitting there in the stands at, at, in Vegas listening to this on the phone just so I can hear it. And Greg's, Greg's not there. It's Mark Durant and Russ Larson, I think, calling it. So I wander upstairs after and find out, well, the game was on in the press box the whole time. Oh, no. So why was I sitting there on <laughs> the phone like an oh, idiot? Well. Uh, one more, 2005, and this happened right in front of my eyes. Yeah, yeah. BYU-TCU, yeah. yeah. overtime mm-hmm. game. 51-50, the Horned Frogs rally back. Their player fumbles the ball out of bounds at the goal line, and it goes into the end zone. I mean, it literally happened right in front of me, Okay. So if that happens, typically 
It's a touchback. And you can see the BYU players right there saying, no, 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 no. He fumbled the ball into the end zone and then out of bounds. It should be a touchback. Ugh! It's a, who, who, who strips it there? Corby Hodgkiss. Who, I, don't, I don't know who it was. Uh, Justin Robinson plating there. I, like, later, you get smart. And, like, where's the cart cam shot on the goal line where you can actually see? Woo! You know what I mean? It's Luke Garot. Justin Luke Garot. Justin Luke Garot, who lived three doors down from me at my first place at BYU. Like, the ball comes out before he's over the goal line. Before, it hits the, before the nose hits the goal line. And, again, the angle is terrible. Can we see you? But I'm right there. Oh, you're right there. There you are, Spence. By the third down marker. Yes. Oh, that's you. The back of your that's head. That's me. The back of your head is ridiculous. Yes. And, and I'm like, what? Wait, wait, what? They, they, the call stands? Oh, you. Yeah, you're jumping up and down. I'm not. I'm trying but, really sir, hard not to sir, cheer in that can you moment. you maintain some okay? decorum here so, on the sideline? So, fun fact, that was the first football game at BYU I was on the sideline for. Very first one. And that happened. And, and, was, and now you're not even on the sideline. You're, <laughs> you're uh, in the, on our set. <laughs> Just kidding. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that, a lot that, of mis- hey, we can play this game all day—the blame that, game. That know? one was was rough. This is great sports talk radio topic, right? Isn't it? Uh, seriously, ah. everyone's got a, a play. They're like, eh. but to your point, not everyone is against BYU, right? Some are for yes, right? Mm-hmm. We tend to forget those a little more because well. they're convenient. <laughs> well, we don't want to bring them up because we don't want to rile up the other fans. <laughs> I want to rile up Utah fans. Luke Staley fumbled. We got to win yeah. with it, man. Well, and there's a story there between Ron McBride and Luke Staley as well. Ron, we heard a funny, <laughs> excellent field story from Ron McBride. <laughs> Pro BYU. At least one of those things was good. No, I, said, I, saw, I said mostly negative right, right. feelings, I saw, not all. I saw and talked to Ron three weeks ago, by the way, randomly. Okay. Anyway. Okay. He was at the Utah Warriors game. Fantastic. Yeah. Our question of the day: What is the biggest missed call? I love this in BYU sports history. Let's, hear it. Let's go to Voice of the Nation. This is the Voice of the Nation on BYU Sports Nation. All right. First response: Pete Andrews on Twitter. Easy. Brandon Bradley's yeah. knee was down. Yeah, yeah. We know it was down. Yeah. The second response: this I is, love, and this one's this off the radar. Oh, I hate this one. Jay Sizzle ninety seven answers on Instagram. Jay Sizzle. Not necessarily a missed call, but I think I speak for all of Cougar Nation. Kai Nakua's targeting against Utah in twenty sixteen. Worst call ever. In a rivalry game. Well, I don't know about. Ever, I don't know if that's worse was, than the Brandon well, Bradley situation. But it, it was it was a missed call, meaning they got the incorrect call, as opposed to uh, you know. I mean, didn't he, have he a leans call. in with the shoulder. He's like turning his head away, but they just because it was helmet to helmet contact from the back of his helmet. They, Winning that game would have changed the entire narrative yes. of everything. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Coming up, that one hurt. Was it a Masters win somehow for BYU? And David Nixon explains who the next great pro prospect is for BYU football, as well as why he thinks Zach Wilson just might succeed in New York. This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Andrew Pintarn, BYU Baseball host Utah tomorrow in a rivalry game at Miller Park. 8 Eastern on the BYU TV app, part of a... uh, it's, it's not a doubleheader. What is it, Spence? It's a simultaneous softball Idaho State and baseball against Utah situation. Yeah. You can call it a call literal it? back-to-back. It's Yeah, yeah. And it's you and I calling the games <laughs> back-to-back. You're on one side of the yes. of literally a wall, and I'm on the other. It's literally. And if you're too loud, I'll bang on the wall, yeah. <laughs> we are live in Studio B with your day-to-day BYU Sports play-by-play. Happy Monday. I'm Spencer Linton alongside Jerem Jordan. Joining us now on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline, Fresh off a bougie vacation to Cabo San Lucas, golf, sunshine, swimming, the beach. David Nixon is back. Well rested. David, great to have you on the show. You're looking tan, my friend. I need a vacation from you guys. It's good to get away. I've regrouped, <laughs> and I'm, I'm ready to go. Here, here comes football in, what, four months or so? We're, we're right around the corner. Yeah, let's not bury the lead, though. Uh, hanging out with Taysom, of course, the uh, brother-in-law and other family. but uh, And then Craig Bill. So it's like... I mean, how, how much are you talking football? How much are you not talking football? The funny thing is we actually do bring up a lot of the memories and we chat about football and, and you know, just things we remember from our days. But uh, it, was, it was a blast, honestly. We, we played a lot of golf, um, some good golf and some not so good golf. But uh, <laughs> all around, all around it, was, it was a good, great time. Good to get some sunshine and, uh, you know, get, get back to Utah and get back to the grind. 
Well, while you were gone, some of us were busy working here in Studio B. So uh, just to get you caught up to date, David, Cam Miller, our friend from SB Nation, football insider, NFL draft expert, college football guy, we asked him, okay, now that Zach Wilson's gone, who's the next best pro prospect at BYU? And without hesitation, he gave us his answer. He said, Peyton Wilgar, the linebacker. For you, how would you answer that question? Who's the next best pro prospect coming out of BYU football? Listen, you guys know how I feel about Peyton Wilgar. Ever since he's a freshman, I've been on the Peyton Wilgar train. I love the way he plays, especially in space, uh, when he's out there on, on the number two, number three receiver and the way he covers. Uh, but I also like the opposite of the ball, Tyler Algier. And I know this isn't very conventional because a lot of the, he's not a conventional back in the NFL, but this is a guy who's a bruiser and a guy that, that loves the position he plays. But you can't bring him down on first contact. And I think that's something the NFL teams love. If you need a third down back, a third and short back, you put in Tyler Algier, and he's going to get you that one or two yards. And so I, I'm excited to see how he has uh, what type of season he has this year uh, because I think he is one of those guys that if he can continue to put on good film and good tape, I think some team would take a, take a leap on him. But uh, this team, it's going to be interesting to see how they all evolve. You've got the schedule. The schedule's in place. Now you're going you're to be on primetime television like they are every year during Independence. Um, now who can kind of step up to the plate and, and, and kind of come about as we saw last year with Zach, Zach took advantage of, of the COVID year and, and the type of season they had, as we see. Uh, and, and the question is this coming year, who's going to be able to take advantage of their schedule they have with the packed P5 schedule? Let me add something else to your, I guess, argument for Tyler Algier. Apparently, he just ran a 4 3 9 40. Mm. And he's a beast. How about that, David Nixon? I love the four three nine. I, I love to fact check the laser or the t- the hand time, whoever it was. I, I like a little more details behind that. But listen, if, if you're Tyler Jr. in the size that he's at, even if you're in the four four range, I mean that's huge. And, and, and we see that unfortunately with the, in the NFL, it all comes down to your forty times. A lot of times that's whether that's, that's what decides whether you make the cut or not, and whether a GM is willing to take a chance on you or not. And so if he can be in the four four range, the size he's at, the way he runs. Man, I mean, that all of a sudden drafts his, or boosts his draft status for sure. What was your fastest 40? Uh, four, five, six. Coming four. out of uh, at BYU, my, my senior year at BYU. So. Okay. You and Austin you know, Collie? Not 439, not 439, four, not 439. Not, uh, <laughs> four, 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 yeah, I'll take my four, five. Chris yeah. Wilcox, right? That was, that was insane. Okay, that, that's a fun answer because there's certainly, you know, a couple of guys here that, that are in the mix, and we talked about them too. Like, I think Puka Nakua could be in the mix in a year or two, right? Isaac Rex is an intriguing guy. He's going to be in every national magazine going into this offseason because he caught like 10 touchdown passes, right? Ryan Rico is an interesting one to me too. People don't want to talk about punters, but David, I think he's an NFL punter. And then uh, James Empey, um, Spencer brought up, and, and Tyler Algier. So there are certainly some guys. And then there's going to be a, a – I wonder about a couple of offensive linemen as well, but – it took a sec for us to get to this point. It took a pandemic, unfortunately, to blow up the schedule. But here we are, and BYU has, is going to have a plentiful NFL draft. And then I think a couple of guys in next year's draft. So we almost forget, David, that sometimes it takes time. It took Kalani Satake a fifth year to really get on the map, and, and it paid off. And, and let me say this. Brady Christensen, with what he did in his pro day and what he did this season – has helped this BYU offensive line unit big time. And you mentioned Nippy's name, and he's a name I had written down as well. I think he's a guy that benefits from a great year like Brady Christensen, where all of a sudden you put the offensive line back on the map. I mean, it's been a while since BYU had an offensive lineman drafted, and there's some bias towards that with missions, et cetera. Uh, but now the way that Brady performed, and, and I think he'll be a, probably a first, second, uh, you know, probably first or second, maybe third round. He slips to the third round. But the way he performed, he, he definitely boosted his draft stats as well. But I think that helps his offensive line. You've got Clark Barrington. You've got Empey. You've got a lot of guys that have the free lane. You've got, you've got guys that have the ability to go to the next level. But for one reason or another, I think BYU's offensive alignment got kind of passed over in years past. But now uh, Brady put them back on the map. And so excited to see what happens with that unit. But you're right. This, this team has a ton of talent. And this is how it always is in April, March, April, right? We're sitting here thinking, who's going to emerge? And I think that's what's so great about fall camp and with the schedule Somebody's going to have to emerge as a playmaker, and if you can be that playmaker, then all of a sudden you have a chance at the next level. David Nixon with us on BYU Sports Nation. We've also been discussing the biggest missed calls in the history of BYU sports. <laughs> this based on what happened between the Braves and the Phillies last night. Close play at the plate. It determined the game. 
We all thought, as well as most of Major League Baseball, that it was clearly not a run, but the umps looked at it at five different angles and somehow said that the Phillies scored. So it got us thinking, all right, how, uh, how have things impacted BYU in that regard? So in your opinion, what's the biggest missed call in the history of BYU sports? What do we have? We have 45 minutes. I mean, how long do we have to talk about this? I mean, I could, I could go on. I mean, listen, I'll talk about my, my personal career. I, I look back, I think of 2006, the offensive pass interference on Matt Allen in the end zone. I mean, terrible call. Uh, and in 07, the fumble that was not a fumble by Vic Soto against UCLA at the Rose Bowl. Mm. I mean, those are a few, those are a few of the calls. I mean, there was a, uh, it was Doman. Sean Doman had an interception that they overturned somehow that same game in 07 against UCLA. So listen, there's, there's calls. You can go back and forth. I will say this. The bad thing was we were playing on versus. And of course there were no replays. There were like two cameras in the whole stadium. So <laughs> I, I don't blame the rats for not being able to overturn it, but uh, no, I mean, there's, there's some blown calls. That, that, that one last night was I'm with you. I don't know how they came to conclusion there, but uh some of my career were probably those two that come to mind. When you think of blown calls, those oh, 06 and 07, those are, those are, those are tough ones because we end up having we win 11 and two both years, and you take away a couple of those blown calls, we go 11 and one, or maybe we catch some other momentum. You go undefeated. It's a lot of woulda, coulda, shoulda, I guess. Well, tis the season, right? It's April, so uh, here we are. What what's the call that you totally got away with yourself? Like you <laughs> held or you pi'd in a game where you were like, dude, I got lucky. I mean, there's plenty of those. Uh, I'd say the one it goes back to high school. Actually, we we're playing our rival. The ball was on the one-yard line. They run like a quarterback sneak. We stop them on third down. There's only like 10 seconds left. The clock's ticking. I get up. I look back. I see there's only like four seconds left. So I jump back on the pile. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and like, like you can see in the film, I stand up. I look behind me. And all of a sudden, you can see me just jump and leap back on the quarterback <laughs> as, he, as he's trying to get up. Sure enough, clock expired. We won the game on the one-yard line. Held them for the winner. Uh, that's probably that's probably what I got away with at uh, our rivals, our rival Brian High School. The to this day, I think they're still bitter about it, but so well. I love it. <laughs> David Nixon sharing some absolute delightful uh, plays from his high school career on BYU Sports Nation. As we push forward to BYU football in 2021, I know crazy that it's only four months away, but yet here we are. Who's going to be the face of Cougar football when the 2021 season kicks off? Listen, I hate to admit it because I'm a defensive guy, but it's always a quarterback. It's always a quarterback. Which listen, one, Michael, David? So, I, listen, I, I, I love this. I love the fact – I mean, you look back at last year, and, and we you know, go into the season, Zach Wilson, who's not going to be the number two pick overall, uh, there, he was in a quarterback controversy. They weren't sure if it was going to be Baylor or him who started the season. Um, and I love that about this year. Yeah, we don't have a clear cut number one, but you love the competition because it truly does bring out the best. And I'll tell you what, during the summer when those PRP, the player run practices start to evolve, you'll see who the true leader is of this team. Is it, is it Jacob Conover, this freshman coming out, you know, registered freshman, or is it Baylor Rodney? Who's going to be the vocal Jaron Hall? Who's going to be the vocal guy to emerge as the face of BYU? Cause that's what it is. The, the quarterback is the position that's the face of, of the team. So um, I think that's what's most exciting. I think we'll start to see some names leak of guys who have really taken the reins um, or the ones calling, making sure that everyone's there because they're, you know, they're guys that inevitably are going to be on vacation or sleeping in. Who's calling each one guy, each guy individually and saying, get your butt out of bed and get over here to the <laughs> practice field. And so uh, I, I think that's the intriguing thing. And then of course, during fall camp, hopefully with COVID easing, we'll be able to go to the practice, this go around, uh, be able to see those guys in, in full action. But it's exciting. And once again, I, I, a lot of people say that's a bad thing BYU had to sell on a quarterback. I think it's a great thing because competition brings out the best in you and, and it really pushes each one individually. And so I'm excited to see how that all evolves. And, and the good thing is you have three very capable quarterbacks. Um, of course, Conover hasn't gotten a college snap in a game, uh, but you've got, uh, you know, Jaron Hall and Baylor Romney who have played plenty in, in live games. And so for BYU fans, you, you know you're rolling into your first game with somebody that most likely has had some game time experience. Let's break down what you just said. So you talked about the vocal leadership. Baylor's not a vocal guy. He's the quarterback who makes the simple play and the simple throw, and he's predictable and awesome and good, right? Beat Boise State, amazing. Jacob Conover's a freshman. Do you want to throw a freshman into the mix to command the group, albeit Jacob's pretty unique, right? Turn down Alabama for a scully. And then there's Jaron Hall. To me, it's clearly Jaron Hall. And maybe it's not so clear right now, but I think it will be later that he's the guy. He's been in the system He's, he's the most athletic quarterback there. He makes a great throws as well. 
To me, it's going to be Jaron Hall. Because I wonder if you want to throw a freshman, like blind resume, you don't want to throw a freshman at 7P5s. Baylor, you know what you get, which is good. The ceiling's probably a little bit higher with Jaron. Do you feel like it's Jaron's job to lose? I, you know, I, I think there's elements of each player, and I think that's why they haven't settled on as a particular player. I, I will say this. That, that's so that no one transfers, David. Hey, I'll say this. The, the, when it comes to a quarterback, it's all about confidence. And, and when, you're, when you're a player on defense, offense, you can, you can feel that confidence from the quarterback. And so wh- wh- it, they don't have to be vocal. They don't have to be something that's going out there rah-rah on everybody. It's can they step out there and do the players have trust in that quarterback that he knows what he's doing, he knows his proper checks, can he command the offense? And so I think that's still the verse is still out. And, and I think that's what fall camps can be all about. And that's what uh, Aaron Roderick and his offensive staff, that's what they have to figure out is, is who's going to be that guy and who exhibits all of those qualities. Because you're right, it's not just a, hey, let me call everybody, let me be the rah-rah guy, because a lot of times some of those guys are fake, right? It's like you talk the talk, but you can't go out there and walk the walk on the field. You're not, you don't have the ability. Uh, and so it's, you put all those elements and all those qualities into the big basket, and that's when hopefully one of those guys evolves. But um, I don't know if there's a leg up. I mean, I, I obviously, you know, Jaron's played well and uh, Baylor's played well, but – uh, Jaren's had his injury, so I think there's pros and cons with every guy. Yeah, Conover is a freshman, um, so that's a con against him. But the pros, we heard that he tore up the scout team defense last year in practice. He was out there just tearing him up left and right, and so I, you, you don't know. And I think that's the beauty of it. Once again, there's no clear-cut guy to where it's a true competition. Former BYU and NFL linebacker David Nixon on BYU Sports Nation. While we're on the topic of confidence, if you can quantify it. How confident are you in the idea of Zach Wilson being the next starting quarterback for the New York Jets? It blows my mind. In fact, uh, Taysom, while well, we're down there in Cabo, we talked about it. He was obviously very excited for, for Zach. Um, and, and hopefully this year for Taysom, he's starting as well. So we'll have two BYU starters. I think they, they, they clash, I think, what, week three or four I read somewhere. Uh, maybe we have an all-BYU quarterback matchup in the NFL. But – um, I'm obviously pretty confident, especially when they trade away Sam Darnold. That, I think that was a telltale sign that they're going after Zach. Uh, but, you know, listen, in the NFL, it's all about getting your shot. And, and yeah, we understand the, the woes of the Jets and kind of their past history. But you look at their draft, the picks they have this year, they have uh, three picks within the top 34 picks. They have five within the top 90. So, so they have the ability to go out there and get some talent to surround Zach with. Granted, these are a lot of rookies, which you don't love. You want some veteran guys in the mix as well. But, uh, they can go out there and pick up some good talent to try to protect them and, and, to, and to provide some support for them. So uh, the picks are there. I mean, they've traded away from their best player, Jamal Adams, Sam Darnold. I mean, they've gotten picks in, in, um, by, by doing that. But I, I'm excited for it. I mean, listen, the good thing is as a rookie quarterback, there's, there's a long leash there, right? You understand that there's going to be some growing pains. It's a process. It's, you know, you probably won't start seeing the fruits of it until two or three years down the road. Uh, but for Zach, I mean, it's what an opportunity to go start in the NFL week one, because when you're taking the top two, top three pick, you're almost guaranteed to, to, to start. They're expecting you to come in and start away, right away. So uh, we'll see how it all plays out. But pretty exciting times with the draft being, what, three weeks away? Now less than three weeks. So exciting to see what, what happens with him and, of course, with all the other BYU players. David, great to catch up with you, man. Uh, we would love to play golf with you at some point in Cabo if you'd like to invite us. Or in Provo. Just throwing it out there. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, it, we're going to put it on the calendar. I can't wait. Jeremy, I've heard your driving game. is just phenomenal. So I can't wait to see it. unbelievable. <laughs> My driving to the course. Yeah. Yeah. Very safe. Very, very <laughs> uh, methodical approach for sure. David, great to talk to you, man. Thanks for the time. All right, guys. Take care. David Nixon on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline. Deseret First, you know why we show how. I'm not seeing the Jets schedule out, so maybe he tipped his hand a little bit week three or four. Yes, so the Saints are scheduled to play the AFC East. There's a rotating schedule every year. We just don't know. They just haven't named the team. So maybe they – Maybe Taysom told David who told us. Taysom and Zach early. How fun would that be? Head to head. Woo! BYU on BYU quarterback crime. Let's see. uh, Ty Detmer with the Eagles against Steve Steve Young Young with the Niners on Monday Night Football in like 92 or something. It hasn't happened often. Right. Maybe – did Mark Wilson ever play McMahon or something? I'm guessing, yeah, maybe at some point. Virgil Carter against nobody from BYU. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That that could be fun, man. Okay, coming up, buy or sell the Jets doubling their win total with Zach Wilson, at least. And is there a new most dominant – team on campus who is it we'll discuss next on BYU Sports Nation this segment of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Visible Supply Chain Management 
If you like winning, homers, great defense, hey, Chris Paulson and BYU Sapo host Idaho State tomorrow. Watch the game. 8 Eastern on the BYU TV app. Nine-game win streak for the ladies right now. He is Jeremiah I am Spencer. This is BYU Sports Nation. I'd like to bring up a tweet for our question of the day. Mm-hmm. What is the biggest missed call in BYU sports history? At BF Webster says, the fact that I can't think of one other than the late buzzer beater by Gonzaga women's basketball against BYU in the WCC title game suggests I'm either well-balanced and able to let things go or that I should turn to my BYU paraphernalia in shame. No, great. Uh, point six, the catch and shoot from Jill Townsend. Our, our issue with this play was, uh, you know, not that she made it. Of course she made it, but was it in time? The catch and gather... The clock doesn't start for a little bit, so you wonder if she gets it off, blah, blah, blah. You know, it, it happened, whatever. Gonzaga lost in the first round. BYU didn't. All good. Yep. BYU like, 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 got all, all uh, the last laugh in a way. Right. And Gonzaga women's hoops is awesome. It's a great rivalry. It came down to the wire. That was a sure. fantastic game. Unfortunately, it didn't go BYU's way. But it didn't cost BYU the NCAA tournament. We got- and BYU lost to the runner-up. Moral victory. Moral victory. <laughs> Let's whip it. Cougar Whip Round presented by Visible Supply Chain Management tackling America's most challenging shipping problems. Okay, Masters champ Hideki Matsuyama's win. Is that a pseudo win for BYU since translator Bob Turner attended BYU and served his mission to Japan? Sure. I'll take anything (laughs) I can get. Speaking of moral vision. Nice job, Bob, being the translator for Hideki uh, Matsuyama and... Uh, Hideki is also close with another former BYU guy, Corey Yoshimura. So, who is the guy working for the PGA Tour in Japan, BYU graduate? Amigo de us. Yeah. Uh, this is not a win for BYU. Uh, Mike Weir actually won in 2003. <laughs> so, no, he didn't that, need a translator. Cool. Translate this as he, uh, you know, yeah. birdied, uh, you know, 16, 17, 18. Jeremy, the West Coast Conference names Santa Clara women's soccer the regular season champions based on Ken Pomeroy's adjusted win percentage metric. Wait a minute. Is this fair? Yeah. Ken Palm knows numbers. It's not sports specific to hoops. That's fine. Uh, good for Santa Clara. Yay. Uh, BYU took second even though they still have Portland coming up, right? That was determined? Or is that still? Yep. Up? Uh, got, got to be Portland though to make the tourney, I think. So um, keep it going for BYU. Women's soccer didn't know uh, Ken Palm adjusted win percentage came into soccer. It didn't come into women's volleyball, by the way. Which is okay. So just like I don't understand. whatever it works for. Well, well that's the know. thing with this adjusted win percentage in hoops. It was like suddenly it was like poof, we have this thing. My issue wasn't that it existed; it was the timing. Sure. And again, it's like, oh, this is the thing. Oh, okay. Why didn't we do this all year? Why didn't you mention this all year? If it benefited BYU, though, would we be like, oh yeah, this is awesome. oh, this is great, this is this great, is amazing, yeah. BYU softballs won nine in a row, undefeated in West Coast Conference play. Will they run the table the rest of the way? I don't think so. Softball is such a delicate, weird game sometimes. How dare you? And it, it just, it's a fickle beast, you know? Softball and baseball are this way. So I just think it's really hard to win a bunch of games in a row. I mean, it's, a, it's incredible that BYU's won nine in a row already. They they might, but just the way that the game works, percentages, I, I don't think so. I, I'm going to give them room for at least one loss, and they'll still be the WCC champions and go to the tournament. Will BYU softball win 20 games in a row? That's crazy. They have a bunch of non-con left, too. Uh, no. In WCC play, still no. Yes, because if you win 60% of the games in, like, the majors, you're really good. Yes. So I'm going to say they're going to lose, you know, two or three. Uh, not WCC, maybe one or two. But, no, they're, they're going to win a and bunch. And still dominate. Yes, still dominate. Still go to the NCAA Regionals and press for a Super Bowl. Jeremy, the Cougarettes win another national championship in the hip-hop division. 20 national titles total wow. for the Cougarettes. Are they the most dominant program on campus? That's one of the dumbest questions that have ever been asked in the history of this program. Of course they are. They are the most dominant. Who is more dominating than the Cougarettes? Yeah. Then 20 on, national championships. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. hmm. No, women's volleyball. And I know that there are a number of different competitions, but sure. the Cougarettes no compete. Butts. They compete in the highest level dance competition available in the country. They go against the best of the best. This yeah. isn't some lower tier Division II 
hey, we were national champions because we went to a competition with four teams and it's that hip-hop. aren't very good. It's hip-hop and it's BYU. So that is a clash of uh, cultural prejudices right there. Well, Cosmo and the Cougarettes are changing minds, Jeremy. Yeah, BYU can dance, man. Let's go. So you think you can dance. Okay, and our uh, question of the day deals with missed calls. Sometimes a great call can go your way like Friday night, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. We told Mitch McIntyre that he had the BYU Sports Nation karma and... Kind of believed it. Okay, he kind of believed He went yeah. along yeah, with it. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. He Skeptical. hits a ground ball in the bottom of the ninth, scoreless game, and one of the best second basemen in the entire conference, Jake Sakata, bobbles the ball, and Mitch is safe. Allowing BYU to walk it off. Well, 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 Mitchell. Looks so like yeah, Jason Shepard uh, was calling the game on radio, and he's like, "Oh, the karma's real." Yeah, karma. yeah you better believe we're going to take yep. credit for that, man. Yep, yep, oh, yep. it just so happened that you hit the ground ball that one of the best second basemen oh. bottled bottom of the ninth, scoreless game. Oh, it's weird. We want some credit. Is what we want. Really. <laughs> Coming up, Jared Ward delivers, but not in the way you're thinking. <laughs> Great story. And buy or sell. No New York Jets fans watched Zach Wilson play football while he was at BYU. Rich Eisen, you dog. This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Catch the latest BYUSN right now with Kiki Solano. Social media twist on stuff. Super creative, amazing, awesome. Check it out on our social media platform. Love the 80s retro vibe from the West Coast Conference Awards for BYU Women's Volleyball. That was, that was really fun. Was really they, fun. Do, they do some great work. They're awesome. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation live from Studio B. It's time for Buy or Sell, presented by Tim Daly Ford, part of the Tim Daly Auto Group, serving Utah since 1968. Let's bring in the third voice of the program, Ben Bagley. Buy or sell. The fact that Rich Eisen says less than 1% of Jet fans have seen BYU play this season. Well, I buy the idea, but I sell the the logic. Uh, highlights on the internet? Yes. How many BYU fans have watched Jet games? Uh, <laughs> same percentage, right? But it, you can go back and watch highlights. Well, that, but even in the moment, I still think Jets fans were watching especially on Labor Day night, because nobody else was playing and BYU was playing Navy with Reese Davis and Kirk Herbstreit on the call. So I'm guessing that a good deal of Jets fans, football fans in general, saw at least that game. And then when BYU started to go on a run, you're telling me that when BYU went to Coastal Carolina, that Jets fans and football fans in general weren't dialed into, oh man, BYU's... and you. Yes, like, they, they make the trip. It's ESP, It's college game day. Well, I don't care it's, if... I don't, selling on I don't care if it's 1%. There are highlights. I would say 100% of Jets fans have seen highlights of Zach Wilson. Oh, yes. By now, <laughs> absolutely. Right. Number two. Buy or sell the Jets being able to put enough talent around Zach Wilson this season to double their win total from last <laughs> season from two. I think if it's only four wins, uh, Jet fans <laughs> bye, are going to be Bye, bye, bye. Yeah, they're going to be really upset. Um, I don't have a ton of confidence that they're going to surrender. It starts with the offensive line. If you can't have a decent offensive line, that, that old line is bad. They've got an all-pro left tackle protecting the blind side. So they've got something there protecting Zach Wilson's blind side. Other than that, they have some serious gaps yeah. to fill. And the, yes, they signed Corey Davis, but Corey Davis hasn't had a thousand yard season like he almost did last year. But he he's not the he's not as what they were hoping he would be in Tennessee, and now now he's there. Jamison Crowder's a good receiver. Yeah, Denzel, Denzel Mims, right? Um, they just signed Tevin Coleman, who's like a washed up guy from the Niners and Falcons from before, but. I am not confident they're going to surround him with enough talent to uh, win four well, games. Well, well, to win four, yes. Okay, but I'm okay. talking to do something oh, that man. matters. Winning four games doesn't matter. <laughs> Come on, if they win, if they only win four, they're going to be ticked. I'm happy if the Jets win six games. Six is a Seriously, step in the right direction. Going from two to six with a rookie yes. quarterback, yes. starting right out of college. Yeah, get to six wins. Uh, I yes, I am buying 100 percent that they have enough draft picks and yes. talent That's to help Zach Wilson get to four wins. That's a low bar. Ten picks this year. They got five in the top 90 this year and 21 total over the next two years. The Jets have some moving pieces, and Robert Saul is a culture guy. Give him time. Like it, it's he's a winning good. guy, too. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, buy it. Let's go. Number three. 
Buy or sell the best missed call of the weekend being the missed call at home plate to win the BYU baseball game. Uh, <laughs> always, always good to win either way. Sure. Over the weekend? Sure. Yeah, yeah. No, Bye. so here's the thing. So the back story, okay? Jacob Wilk, who's the first baseman for BYU and a designated hitter, he doesn't get the call from his coach, Mike Littlewood, at third base to show bunt late. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so he's swinging away. And Mike Littlewood's like, whoa, what is he doing? And he's like, oh, I guess that'll work. I'm guessing Mike said something else. Yeah, he hits the ball off the wall in left field because he missed the call from his coach. That's hilarious. Instead of bunting. Now that's a missed call. It works out, right? Another one. Positive things for BYU. Yeah, that's I'm buying that. That's the best missed call. Yeah. At least over the weekend. (laughs) Really, over the weekend. (laughs) What were the others again? Coming up, the elite of elite missed calls. Yeah, and paying ultimate respect to the game. Some incredible images from Augusta National yesterday. This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. BYU Sports Nation's Rise and Shoutout is presented by Mountain America Credit Union, guiding you forward. BYU Sports Nation, always available on demand via the BYU TV and BYU radio apps. And I don't know if you knew this. Uh, there is a podcast, perhaps you're even listening to it uh, right now, called BYU Sports Nation, the podcast. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review it. Welcome back to the show. Our question of the day, what's the biggest missed call in BYU sports history? Quite a question. Our elite voice of the day, presented by Sundance Mountain Resort from at Jimmer Ainge. Worst missed call. 1981, Elite Eight, Ralph Sampson of Virginia put his hand on the backboard, no call, then Ainge got a technical foul for protest for protesting, changed the whole game momentum. Second worst, the 37 (laughs) illegal screens in this year's UCLA NCAA tournament loss. Wow, 37. I I only had 23, so that's crazy. Uh, John Rothstein put out his uh, top 45 for... Uh, next season, he has UCLA as the number one team in the country. They go in as like the 30, 43rd. Is Johnny Juzang coming back? I don't care if they're all coming back. They had an incredible run. That doesn't mi- – like, I, I have this They're argument. now the number one team in the country? I, I don't have that. I don't have that. Okay, today's Rise and Shoutouts presented by Mountain America Credit Union. Guiding you forward, uh, shout-out to Jared Ward, Olympic marathoner from BYU. Uh, tweets, first baby at home. Midwife on the way, Erica says, I can feel his head. I ask her if we can get to the bed. She says, no, get your hands uh, down there. Team effort today. Wonderful midwife, Carla, arrived minutes later to handle the rest. (laughs) So he delivered a baby from home himself. (laughs) Holy shnikes. Jared, that is is crazy. That is nuts. That's amazing. So congrats to the wards. Um, Apparently everything was fine. Yeah, I'm so glad the baby is healthy, his wife's healthy. Talk about delivering that could be scary. in the clutch. Let's let's. Oh, I oh okay. Blaine Fowler. You should ask Blaine Fowler about this because I think was it his daughter or daughter-in-law delivered like on the side of the freeway one time. <laughs> yeah, seriously, crazy. What in the world? Crazy. Oh. So Jared took care of business, got the baby delivered. Nice work. Very cool. Actual victory. <laughs> that is an actual victory. My rise of shout out goes to Hideki Matsuyama's caddy Shota Hayafuju who bowed to Augusta National as he put the flag back in on the 18th green after Matsuyama had won the Masters. Really cool moment. Huge moment for Japan. This is a cultural thing, traditional thing. Uh, we talked about uh, our buddy Kori Yoshimura, who's over in Tokyo working on the PGA Tour. He, he mentioned in a tweet yesterday that after Little League games, they'll all bow to the field yeah. at, out of respect yeah. for whatever competition in the game they're playing in. I love that. Yeah. That's awesome. I that was cool, and obviously there's like a reverential thing with uh, you know Augusta. You guys talked about last week the different places in sports. Tom Homo fun comment about yeah. the Rose Bowl. The Rose Bowl being is, he said special, not non BYU venue, right? Like the actual game there, you know, special. So that's cool, man. That's cool. So uh, we're back. It was good to be back, man. Yeah. I had a week off. It was nice. Jerem's it was on good vacation. To, good to be back. Let's go. I had uh, I had somebody ask me the baseball game. Hey, where's Jerem? And I'm like, he'll be back. It's on good Monday. to know one person cares. That's he'll great. be back on Monday. No one else asked me that in the building. <laughs> Our thanks to today's guest, David Nixon. Sorry to Dennis Pitta, who apparently uh, hosted the show a while back. Yeah. Hello, Jerem. Yeah,
He's there. For Jerem, I'm Spencer. Shout out to Markel Stafari. We'll see you tomorrow on BYU Sports Nation. Go Cougs!